b-ball, shooting hoops, round ball, no matter what you call it, it's truly the American game of basketball. In this episode, we'll take a look at its simple history and its popularity today. I'm Chris Casey, and this is Sea to Shining Sea. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sea to Shining Sea. I'm Chris Casey, and this is episode five, where we're going to talk about the wonderful, truly American game of basketball, where it came from, its humble beginnings, similar to the football episode we did previously. I'd like to thank each and every one of you who downloaded. We're almost to 200 downloads. Uh, who knows who thought that... Six months ago, when I decided to venture into the wonderful world of podcasting, this rookie podcaster would have almost 200 downloads uh, within that amount of time. I do appreciate each and every one of you who've listened, and reach out to me. I I have an email now, uh, c to shining c 2019 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at chriscasey71. Again, welcome. If this is the first time listening, I hope you enjoy this episode. We're going to talk about the American game of basketball. I mentioned at the end of episode four that we were going to talk about March Madness. Well, March became madness, but not college basketball. The world is a a crazy place right now. I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy, and we will all get through this, as everybody has said. So let's use this episode to escape from the the world that we live in right now and just enjoy a little uh, history lesson on a game we all love so much. Why would I do basketball? Well, after researching for this episode, I decided to look into everything, and I took a look back at my childhood, and you know what? Basketball's been in my life pretty much since I was a kid, just like most kids in the 70s and 80s, we had our, and, and even kids today, I guess, we all had a basketball hoop. I didn't have a backboard, but I have a garage with just a hoop. And I'll tell you what, I spent hours upon hours on our gravel driveway. Uh, it wasn't even paved, uh, shooting basketball. If it was just me, we'd have a, a group of kids from the block. You know, I'm sure other folks listening uh, grew up with that same simple life of of just shooting hoops man i mean if we had a grade school across the street we had chain the nets on the school uh hoops or chains i'm sure some folks out there listening can rec- recognize what i'm talking about yes the nets were actual chains i guess because it stood up to the weather more but i remember playing in the playground way back in the day and then all of a sudden you know this Just taking a look back, I can't believe that basketball has been in my life this much. I played a little basketball in high school and then also in the Air Force when I was in the military, played a little uh, intramural basketball. And then getting out, I coached a little bit. Uh, I've coached for the YMCA, which is a big, the YMCA we're going to talk about here briefly. We're going to talk about here shortly. And I tell you what, I've also got a chance as an announcer to announce basketball Uh, junior college basketball. Shout out to the SCC Blackhawks in West Burlington, Iowa. Coach Watkins uh, letting me uh, announce a few games for them. Uh, And I also got a broadcast, the same team I broadcast football, the West Burlington Falcons in West Burlington, Iowa. Shout out to them as well. You know, living in a town with a National Basketball Association team, the Charlotte Hornets in our backyard, that's kind of cool. I've been to a couple games. I actually got an experience and I'll mention a little more on this later on in the episode, but I got to experience an NBA All-Star Weekend. So I've been around basketball quite a bit in my life. And to take a look at where it came from and where it is today, its history and its popularity, it's going to be cool to take a look at. Uh, not only am I going to talk about the history of the game, I'm going to talk about some cool highlights in the history, how it was created, a certain team that everybody has known since the 1920s and still going today. We're also going to talk about the popularity, take a look at the levels of high school, college, and pros, and how many kids are playing the game today. I'm also going to have a, a little 
segment where I talk about funny nicknames. In the game of basketball, we have funny nicknames. Dr. J, Spud Webb, Shaq Diesel, all those little fun names. I'm going to give you just a few uh, to give you some laughs here before the end of the episode. And then when I'm going to finish the episode here, I'm going to talk about my top five. In the game of basketball, we have starting five players on the court, uh, five against five. Uh, in most basketball situations now. But uh, I'm going to give you my top five starters of all time. From This is going to be college pros from beginning to end. My top five uh, before I finish the episode. So, without further ado, let's take a look where all this wonderful game of basketball came from. The birthplace of basketball. This is courtesy of the Springfield.edu website. Basketball is built in the fabric of Springfield College. The game was invented by Springfield College instructor and graduate student James Naismith in 1891 and has grown into a worldwide athletic phenomenon that we know it to be today. Uh, If you're a basketball fan, I'm sure you've heard of Naismith. This gentleman, well, he is where it all began. In the winter of 1891 and 1892, inside a gymnasium at Springfield College, which was then known as the International YMCA Training School, located in Springfield, Massachusetts, was a group of restless college students. The young man had to be there. They were required to participate in in indoor activities to burn off energy that had been building up since their football season ended. This is in the 1890s. This is long before anything we know of today. Uh, So I find that interesting. The gymnasium class offered them activities such as marching, calisthenics, For those of you who don't know that, that's exercise (laughs) and apparatus work. Uh, But these were pale substitutes for more exciting games such as football and lacrosse that were played in the warmer seasons. Uh, James Naismith was the instructor of this class. He was a 31-year-old graduate student. After graduating from Presbyterian College in Montreal with a theology degree, Naismith embraced his love of athletics and headed to Springfield to study physical education. At the time, a relatively new and unknown academic discipline. Interesting. And he studied under Luther Halsey Gullick, superintendent of physical education at the college, and today renowned as the father of physical education and recreation in the United States. As Naismith, a second-year graduate student who had been named to the teaching faculty, looked at his class. His mind flashed to the summer session of 1891. When Gulick introduced a new course in psychology of play, in class discussions, Gulick had stressed that the need for a new indoor game, one that would be interesting, easy to learn, and easy to play in the winter by artificial light. No one in the class had follow up on Gulick's challenge to invent such a game. But now, faced with the end of fall sports season, students dreading the mandatory and dull required gymnasium work, Naismith had a new motivation. Two instructors had already tried and failed to devise activities that would interest the young men. Faculty had met to discuss what becoming a persistent problem with the class's unbridled energy and disinterest in required work. If you know kids and you keep them indoors for too long, they have too much energy, they need to get out and run. So I could definitely understand the problems these instructors had. During the meeting, Naismith later wrote that he had expressed his opinion that the trouble is not with the men, but with the system we are using. He felt the kind of work needed to motivate and inspire the young men he faced should be a recreative nature, something that would appeal to their play instincts. By the end of that faculty meeting, Gulick placed the problem squarely on Naismith's lap. Naismith, he said, I want you to take that class and see what you could do with it. So Naismith went to work. His charge was to create a game that was easy to assimilate, yet complex enough to be interesting. Had to be playable indoors or in any kind of ground by a large number of players all at once. It should be provide plenty of exercise, yet without the roughness of football, soccer, or rugby, since those would threaten bruises and broken bones if played in confined space. I played some basketball games that were like a rugby game or a football game. I don't know if you have. (laughs) His thoughts were good. Uh, much time and, and thought went into his new creation. It became an adaptation of many games of its time, including rugby, which involved passing, English rugby, which had the jump ball, lacrosse, the use of a goal, 
soccer, the shape and size of the ball. And something called duck on a rock? Never heard of that. A game Naismith played with his childhood friends in Benny's Corner, Ontario. So it's a Canadian thing. Duck on a rock used a ball and a goal that could not be rushed. The goal could not be slammed through, thus necessitating a goal with a horizontal opening high enough that the ball would have to be tossed into it rather than being thrown. Hmm. Sounds familiar. Naismith approached the school janitor, hoping he could find two, yeah, two 18-inch square boxes, not hoops, boxes as goals. The janitor came back with two peach baskets. Yeah, peach baskets. Uh, That's where it all started, guys. Peach baskets instead. Naismith then nailed them to the lower rail of the gymnasium balcony, one at each end. The height of that lower balcony rail, well, it happened to be 10 feet. A man was stationed at each end of the balcony to pick the ball from the basket and would put it back into play. It wasn't until a few years later that those peach baskets were cut to let the ball fall loose. Naismith then drew up 13 original rules, which described, among other facets, the method of moving the ball, what constituted a foul. A referee was appointed. The game would be divided into two 15-minute halves with a five-minute resting period in between. Halftime? Yes. <laughs> Naismith's secretary typed up the rules and tacked them on the bulletin board. Short time later, the gym class met. The teams were chosen with three centers. <laughs> There's a lot of folks playing on this court, folks. Three centers, three forwards, and three guards per side. Two of the centers were met at midcourt. Naismith tossed the ball and the game, da 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 basketball was born. Word of this new game spread white wildfire. It was an instant success. A few weeks after the game was invented, students introduced the game at their own YMCAs. How I mentioned earlier, the YMCA takes a big role into this history of basketball. The rules were printed on a, in a college magazine, which was mailed to YMCAs around the country. Because of the college's well-represented international student body, the game of basketball was introduced to many nations in a relatively short period of time. High schools and colleges began to introduce the game. And by 1905, well, guess what? Basketball was officially recognized as a permanent winter sport. The rules may have been tinkered with, but by and large, the game of basketball has not changed drastically since Naismith's original list of 13 rules was tacked up on that bulletin board. And we'll go over those rules here shortly. (laughs) Interesting to see if they, they match up with the rules we play today. All right, now let's take a look at these original 13 rules of basketball. Number one, the ball may be thrown in any direction with one or both hands. That's still used today. Number two, the ball may be batted in any direction with one or both hands, but never with the fist. Okay. Number three, a player cannot run with the ball. Traveling. The player must throw it from the spot from which he catches it. Allowance may be made for a man who catches the ball when running at a good speed if he tries to stop. Nope, still traveling. (laughs) Number four, the ball must be held in or between the hands. The arms or body must not be used for holding it. Number five, no shouldering, holding, pushing, tripping, or striking in any way the person of of an opponent shall be allowed. The first infringement of this rule by any player shall be counted as a foul. The second shall disqualify him until the next goal is made. That's an interesting concept. Or, if there's an evident intent to injure the person for the whole game, no substitute is allowed. Ejection. On your second foul, you got to sit down to the next basket. Interesting. Number six. A foul is striking at the ball with a fist. All right. Okay. Number seven. If either side makes three consecutive fouls, it shall count for a goal. For the opponents, consecutive means without the opponents in the meantime making a foul. Number eight, a goal. Number eight, a goal shall be made when the ball is thrown or batted from the grounds into the basket and stays there, provided those defending the goal do not touch or disturb the goal. If the ball rests on the edges and the opponent moves the basket, it's counted as a goal. Goal tending! Yeah, early on, right at the beginning, guys. I'm loving these rules. 
Uh, when the ball goes out of bounds, it shall be thrown into the field of play by the first person touching it. In case of a dispute, the umpire shall throw it straight into the field. A thrower in is allowed five seconds. If he holds it longer, it shall go to the opponent. If any side persists in delaying the game, the umpire shall call a foul on that side. Hmm, Five-second rule throwing it in? Ah, that sounds like something that's still going on today. Uh, the And umpires, uh, called umpires back then, not referees. Interesting. Uh, number 10. The umpire shall ju- be the judge of the men and shall note the fouls and notify the referee when three consecutive fouls have been made. Hmm, so we have umpires and referees. He shall have the power to disqualify men, according to Rule 5. Harsh here. The referee shall be the judge of the ball and shall decide when the ball is in play, in bounds, to which side it belongs, and shall keep the time. He shall decide when a goal has been made and keep account of the goals with any duties that are usually performed by a referee. The time shall be two 15-minute halves with five minutes rest between. First and second half with a little half time. All right. I'm liking that. Number 13. The side making the most goals in that time shall be declared the winner. Case of a draw, the game may, by agreement of the captains, be continued until another goal is made. Sudden death. All right. Interesting. And number 14. The original rules of basketball were written by Springfield College graduate instructor James Naismith in December of 1891 and published in January 1892 in the Springfield College School Magazine. And that is the original 13 rules of the game of basketball and its humble beginnings by a YMCA instructor at Springfield College, uh, Mr. James Naismith. And I believe the Basketball Hall of Fame is named after him. So there you go, the humble beginnings of the game we all know and love today. Let's take a moment for a public service announcement. I would like to take a couple moments here to talk about the YMCA. I know it was a big part of where this game was created. I'd like to talk just a little bit about it. I'm sure if you're listening at one time or another in your life, you've either played at a YMCA, been to a YMCA, or have one in your community. Uh, Just taking a look at a little bit of the history of the YMCA, today the Y engages in more than 10,000 neighborhoods across the United States. That's a lot. As a nation's leading nonprofit committed to helping people and communities to learn, grow, and thrive, their contributions are both far-reaching and intimate. From influencing our nation's culture during times of profound social change, to the import individual support we provide an adult learning to read. So they don't, it's not just a place to go work out. They have so many different programs. Of course, it's youth development, young men's Christian association, I believe is what it means for healthy living, for social responsibility. Uh, I have one near my house now and I haven't had made a chance to make it over there uh, with everything going on, but my, plan is this new home that I'm in. I, I want to make a, a trip over there and, and check it out. So if you're interested in being a part of your local YMCA, I've coached for my YMCA. Of course, uh, as my, as a youth, I learned how to uh, swim at a YMCA. And, and I'm sure most of you listening are similar. If you're interested and don't want to know where your local YMCA is, go to ymca.net. Thank you. Now let's take a look at some of the uh, basketball in, uh, of course, we go from this school where the game was created, but we went in to look into our early, early years of college basketball. The greatest level of early basketball activity outside the YMCA's was seen in American colleges. The first known U.S. college to field a basketball team against an outside opponent was Vanderbilt University which played against the local YMCA in Nashville, Tennessee, on February 7th of 1893. Uh, The second recorded instance of an organized college basketball game was Geneva College's game against the New Brighton YMCA on April 8th, 1893 in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, which Geneva won by a whopping three to nothing. (laughs) Interesting. The first intercollegiate match using the modern rule of five players per side is often credited between the University of Chicago and a place I'm very familiar with, the University of Iowa in Iowa City, Iowa on January 18th, 
1896. The Chicago team, which was organized by Amos Alonzo Stagg, who had learned the game from James Naismith at the Springfield YMCA, actually won the game 15-12. to In April of 1905, representatives of 15 colleges separately took over the control of the college game, creating the Collegiate Basketball Rule Committee. The committee was in turn absorbed by the predecessor of the National Collegiate Athletic Association in 1909, and the extremely popular March Madness and CAA Men's Basketball Tournament was started in 1939. So a little bit of history as far as how things got started in college basketball, which, as I mentioned with March Madness, is an extremely popular, <laughs> extremely popular here in our wonderful country, United States of America. In this history lesson of basketball, I'd be remiss for not talking about the one and only Harlem Globetrotters. I know you're whistling sweet Georgia Brown right now. <laughs> that was a terrible job <laughs> to see those guys. Gosh, I remember them as a as a kid seeing the, the Globetrotters either on TV. I've got to see them in person. Sweet Georgia Brown playing in the background and they're doing their tricks with the ball in a circle in the, in the center of the court. Just cool as could be. Well, the Harlem Globetrotters, if you do not know who they are, they're worldwide icons, synonymous with family entertainment and great basketball skills. The Globetrotters represent 90 plus years of breaking down barriers, acts of goodwill, and commitment to fans that go beyond the game. Uh, Abe Saperstein founded the team in 1926. They played their first road game in Hinckley, Illinois on January 7th, 1927. Since then, the Globetrotters have entertained more than 148 million fans in 128 countries and territories worldwide, introducing many to the sport of basketball. The team are pioneers in popularizing the slam dunk, the fast break, the forward and point guard positions, and the figure eight weave. In 2010, the Globetrotters also introduced the first ever four-point shot, a shot located 30 feet from the basket, almost seven feet beyond the NBA's three-point arc. With this Globetrotters mentioning them, I found the top 10 reasons that the Globetrotters are so awesome, and I found the top 10 things you may not know about the Harlem Globetrotters. I'm sure if you're listening, you might have seen them one time or another, but here is 10 things you might not know about the Harlem Globetrotters. The Harlem Globetrotters originated in Chicago, as I mentioned. In spite of the team's name, the squad was born 800 miles west of Harlem in the south side of Chicago. In 1926, a group of former basketball players from Chicago's Wendell Phillips High School, they were united to play for Giles Post American Legion basketball team that bar barnstormed around the Midwest. The following year, the team became known as the Savoy Big Five, while playing home games as pre-dance entertainment at Chicago's newly opened Savoy Ballroom. After a pay dispute, several players bolted the Big Five in 1928 to form the new barnstorming team known as the Globetrotters. Number two, a white Jewish immigrant gave the team its name, that was Abe Saperstein that I mentioned earlier from Chicago's North Side, became the manager of the newly formed Globetrotters. He was a master promoter. Saperstein rechristened the, the team as the New York Harlem Globetrotters in belief that the name would make a greater draw in Illinois and Iowa by giving them an impression that they had traveled far to be there. Uh, the shortest member in the Basketball Hall of Fame, Saperstein also thought that attaching Harlem or to the squad's name would help advertise an all-black basketball team at the height of the Harlem Renaissance. Not until 1968 did the team actually play a game in Harlem. Number three, the Harlem Globetrotters played serious basketball in the early decades. If you've been to a, a Globetrotters game, of course, it's a lot of fun and hijinks and entertainment. Um, but earlier in their history, they played serious basketball. Although known primarily for their on-court antics, the Globetrotters played straight-up basketball games on the outset. The team lost the national championship game in 1939 to another team, the New York Renaissance, but defeated the Chicago Bruins to capture the prestigious World Professional Basketball Tournament the following year. Globetrotters didn't start to incorporate ball tricks and dribbling ex exhibitions until their games in the 1930s. 
1948, the Globetrotters shocked the basketball world by defeating the Minneapolis Lakers. Yes, folks, the Lakers used to play in Minneapolis, not always in L.A. Champions of the National Basketball League, the precursor to the National Basketball Association. The following year, they proved it was no fluke by beating the Lakers again. They were serious. Uh, the NBA's first African-American players were Harlem Globetrotters. The victories by the Globetrotters over the Lakers demonstrated that the African-American basketball players at the time when the NBA, unlike professional football and baseball, had yet to integrate. That changed in May of 1950 when Globetrotters Nat Sweetwater Clifton, first nickname we're saying here on the podcast, Sweetwater, I love that, became the first African-American player to sign a contract with the NBA team by inking a deal with the New York Knicks. Earl Lloyd and Chuck Cooper, who also broke the color barrier in 1950, also played briefly with the Globetrotters. Wilt Chamberlain. Yes, Wilt the Stilt. If you're familiar with NBA history, he actually began his professional career with the team. Uh, one of the greatest basketball players of all time. We'll see if he makes my top five. Uh, <laughs> signed a one-year contract with the Globetrotters, reporting to be worth $50,000 after leaving the University of Kansas in 1958 following his junior year. Chamberlain often said that the year he spent with the Globetrotters was the most enjoyable of his career. He joined the team on a historic 1959 tour of the Soviet Union. In 1959? Wow. During which he shook hands with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. He was the first Harlem Globetrotter to have his number retired. Number six, the Harlem Globetrotters... They actually helped keeping the fledging NBA afloat. While the Globetrotters played to sell out crowds in the 50s, the newly formed NBA struggled to draw more than a few thousand of its fans to games. To drum up interest in a new league, NBA teams scheduled doubleheaders that featured the Globetrotters. As the NBA grew in stature, imagine this, guys. NBA teams couldn't barely draw a thousand people in their, in their arenas. But as the NBA grew in stature... It could pay higher salaries than the Globetrotters, and the best players began to opt for the NBA. Number seven, three baseball Hall of Famers played for the team. Yes, I said that right. Baseball, my favorite sport. Three baseball Hall of Famers played for the team. Yes, in addition to hardwood legends who played for the Harlem Globetrotters, so did three diamond gods, and I mean gods, enshrined in Cooperstown. After signing with my favorite team, the St. Louis Cardinals, Pitcher Bob Gibson, yes, Gibby, <laughs> one of the best that ever was, uh, spent late 1957 playing with the Globetrotters and rooming with Basketball Hall of Famer and who I've seen play, Metal Lark Lemon, until the baseball club reportedly offered more money for him to focus strictly on baseball. Even after winning 20 games for the Chicago Cubs, pitcher Ferguson Jenkins suited up for the Globetrotters during the off-seasons of 1967 and 69. And after winning the World Series title in 1967, another Cardinal and another Cardinal great, speedster Lou Brock also played a handful of games for the Coy Jesters. I love that. That's my, that's my favorite thing I did not know about the Harlem Globetrotters. Number eight, they have lost to the Washington Generals. Yes, the Washington Generals. Have beat the Globetrotters, and everybody who's seen the Globetrotters, that's who they play every game. Uh, when it became more difficult for the Globetrotters to find opponents, they barnstormed the country. Saperstein, in 1953, asked Red Klotz, the coach and manager of the Philadelphia Spas, to tour as the Globetrotters' foils. Now, the Spas had beaten the Globetrotters on several occasions in prior years, but would hardly be the case when Klotz's new squad, which he rebranded the Washington Generals. Although the team took a various identities of the Boston Shamrocks, New Jersey Reds, Atlantic City Seagulls, the players, and losing remained the same. It's estimated that Generals dropped more than 16,000 games to the Globetrotters. But in one shining moment in January 5th, 1971, they drained a last-second bucket to beat the Globetrotters in Martin, Tennessee. The Generals poured orange show on their coach in the locker room. Number nine, the team had, a, had once had a one-armed star. Yes, a player with only one arm. In 1946, Boyd Bowie joined the Harlem Globetrotters as one of the new crop of rookies. Bowie was an amazing talent considering he had lost his left arm in an automobile accident as a teenager. He overcame his handicap to star at Tennessee State and serve as a captain his senior year. As a nine-year member of the Globetrotters, Bowie averaged double digits in scoring. 
One arm. That's awesome. And number t- number 10, the Harlem Globetrotters have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Yes, they do. Uh, the Harlem Globetrotters proved to be entertainers off the court as well. Starring in two 1950s Hollywood movies, including Go Man Go, featuring Sidney Poitier. In the 1970s, they became Saturday morning morning television regulars. I remember watching them. Appearing in two different animated series, Harlem Globetrotters Popcorn Machine, a 1974 live-action variety show. And the team has also solved mysteries with Scooby-Doo and playing a team of robots in Crash Landing in Gilligan's Island. I remember that episode, too. In recognition of their role as entertainers, the Harlem Globetrotters received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 1982. So, the Harlem Globetrotters, they're still touring today. Well, they aren't right now uh, with everything going on in the world, but if you see them come to your town, please give them a chance. If you love basketball, you'll be entertained, thoroughly entertained. As I talk about the Globetrotters, I would like to recognize some friends back in Iowa. So, we kind of use the Harlem Globetrotters as a what's a template for our game that we did. Uh, I have a group of friends that are Special Olympics talent. They are called the Midwest Magic. And I got a chance to be their uh, announcer, their their voice for f- about four different years where they play a game against the uh, local police department there in Burlington, Iowa. And we call it a magical afternoon. And we have so much fun with those players. They're such great competitors. And we make it Globetrotter-esque. Uh, we pick on the, the police officers, all in good fun. It's to raise money for them to to be able to play their tournaments with other Special Olympic adults. So shout out to my friends with the Midwest Magic. I miss you guys. But reading about the Globetrotters made me think of you. All right, folks. Let's move on to our next segment. We'll talk about the popularity today and where it all has come from the beginning. And then I'll mention my top five ever and a few funny nicknames before we close for this episode. Okay, so let's take a look at the popularity of the game in our wonderful nation today. Taking a look first at the high school ranks. How many high school students play basketball? Well, we have in our country right now, as of 2018-2019, in per statista.com, uh, it looks like that calendar year, we had 399,067 girls playing high school basketball and 540,769 boys playing high school basketball. So we're just under a million. And looking back to 20, 2010, uh, the 2010, it's been around a million every year. So it hasn't really dropped off. So we see how popular it is at the high school level. And that's almost a million kids playing basketball. From where this game came from its beginnings to almost a million kids playing basketball. Well, how many kids make their way up to college? Well, we take a look at college out of those million. And this is both men and women college basketball. A total of 18,816 as of April 2020 numbers have participated in NCAA basketball, which is your official college basketball uh, governing body, uh, the one who the one who puts together March Madness every year. And there you go. So out of that amount, they go into the NBA. And how many teams and how many players have come to the NBA or play in the NBA? According to the NBA, Dot com's frequently asked questions. Each team can have a maximum of 15 players, 13 of which can be active for each game. Considering that there are 30 franchises in the league, that means if every team has all active spots filled on their roster, there's a maximum of 450 players in the NBA at any given time. So from a million down to 18,000, down to 450. So this game that started... In the late 1800s, with peach baskets, we have millions of kids playing. And then by the time they get to the NBA, these 450, I would almost call them millionaires, because right now, professional basketball is is become popular you know, with everybody in the game now. While it's not the game we had, and this could be a whole different podcast that I talk about, I am just kind of want to touch base on the popularity of it i tell you what i gotta see it firsthand 
with the NBA here in the Charlotte area and, and seeing All-Star, it was cool. It was cool, but it, it was a whole, oh my goodness, you could just see the money that is involved in in all these franchises and all these players so far ahead of where the game started. So that is a take a look at the popularity here in the United States. A truly American game that has skyrocketed probably farther than anything Mr. Naismith would have thought and in his entertainment uh, from the Globetrotters to today's NBA players, definitely. So let's wrap this episode up. I'm going to take a look at my top five, my starting five. And you know what? I'll also give you five of my favorite nicknames. Uh, so you can have a laugh and we'll end the episode on that. All right. Let's go to my top five, my starting five all-time players. Number one on my top five is going to be Kobe Bryant, who played for the Los Angeles Lakers from 1996 to 2016. Uh, Kobe was a great player um, for all of his statistical achievements and five championships and even an 81-point game. And his 60-point finality was pretty awesome as well. Uh, his lasting legacy and his mental edge, his burning desire to master the sport, and, of course, his Mamba mentality became more, more of a catchphrase after he passed away, sadly, this last year. Kobe Bryant, number five on my list of top five. Number four on my top five of all time is Wilt Chamberlain. I'll tell you what, Chamberlain was truly ahead of his time. His numbers, including his NBA record, 100 points in a single game. Yes, he scored 100 points and averaged 50 points per game for an entire season. They're mythical. Nobody could reach them today. Uh, the only reason he doesn't rank higher is, you know, he only won two NBA championships. <laughs> uh, well, the stilt, as they called him, there's another fun name for you. Played in 1959 to 1962 for the Philadelphia Warriors. Uh, 1962 to 1965 for the San Francisco Warriors, a.k.a. Golden State Warriors now. 1965 to 68 for the Philadelphia 76ers. And then from 68 to 73, for the L.A. Lakers. Number four, Wilt Chamberlain. Number three on my list is Irvin Magic Johnson. Yes, his name is Irvin. <laughs> we just didn't just call him Magic. Magic played for the Lakers from 1979 to 1991 and then came back for one year in 1996. Johnson, he, he revolutionized the game uh, between him and another person that I might mention on this top five uh, as the tallest point guard in league history at six foot nine. Uh, he, several NBA championships with the Lakers. Uh, that's why I put him at number three. Number two on my list is Larry Bird. Yes, Larry Bird. Larry the legend, as they call him. Uh, <laughs> Larry played for the Boston Celtics from 1979 to 1992. I actually have a personal tie with Larry Bird. While I don't know Larry, uh, my great aunt Jean was the basketball secretary for Indiana State during the run of uh, 79 when they went to the title game against Magic Johnson and his Michigan State Spartans. So I've got some stuff that she shared with me, and I've got, got the stories of, of how Larry was. So it's pretty awesome, and, and I always respect Larry. Man, could he play. Uh, he just He actually, along with Magic Johnson, helped revitalize that whole NBA time frame between in the, in the 80s on into the 90s. So, number two, Larry Bird. And who's my number one basketball player of all time? Well, it's not a hard guess. His heiress, Michael Jordan, uh, from the uh, University of North Carolina on to the Chicago Bulls from 1984 to 1993, and then a brief stint with the Birmingham Barons of the Chicago White Sox. Uh, organization, then back to the Bulls in 1995 to 1998. And then he actually played for the Wizards uh, in 2001 to 2003. Uh, the greatest basketball player of all time. That's kind of like the epitome of what James Naismith would have got, wanted a player to be, I'm sure, uh, back when this was created. Uh, he led the Bulls to six NBA championships and winning six finals MVP awards and five regular season MVP honors as well. Of course, his Air Jordan brand is synonymous with sports across all sports, not just basketball. And if you've got a chance to see The Last Dance on ESPN over the last month or so, 
great watch. It makes you even respect this guy a little more. And I know there's people would think LeBron's the greatest and some other players that are in the game today, but I just think that everything that he did over those times, he was in the, the league and utmost respect, sir, you are the greatest basketball player of all time. So there's my top five, my starting five, if I were to pick them, uh, all stars, all best, all world. All right. Now let's finish up this episode. A little bit long winded today. I do, uh, I do like this. It's been a while since I've been back. It feels good to be back. Uh, thank you so much for listening. But as we finish today, let's take a look at the top 10. I'm going to give you 10 great nicknames in the history of basketball. Number 10 is somebody we already talked about. Larry Legend is what they called him. Larry Bird. Yeah. <laughs> he was legendary. That's for sure. Number nine is the Iceman. I love this name. The Iceman. George Gervin. Uh, George Gervin was awesome. He was a, more of a player in the 80s. The Iceman, great nickname. The Answer, those of you who follow the uh, 676ers, you know this to be Allen Iverson. Uh, definitely a, a very good, uh, he, he was he was a great player, but a little controversial at times. But his nickname, The Answer, pretty cool nickname to have. Of course, we already mentioned the greatest basketball player of all time, number seven, Air Jordan. Yeah. All you have to do is say Michael. <laughs> I, I don't know how many people do say Air Jordan, but that is a pretty cool nickname. And that's what his brand is called as well. One of my favorites growing up before Michael Jordan was the one and only Dr. J. Yes, Julius Irving, the doctor. I'll tell you what, his dunks were epic. And they pretty much, uh, the reason guys dunk today, how they dunk today, he pretty much brought that to the forefront uh, along with Wilt Chamberlain. But Dr. J, number six. Number five, Hakeem the Dream Olajuwon. Yes, the big man from Houston. <laughs> Hakeem the Dream. Another one of my favorites at number four is the Round Mound of Rebound. And if you watch the NBA on TNT, you see him every time that they're on. Yes, the one and only Charles Barkley. <laughs> and he's more round now than he ever was. <laughs> uh, I remember Charles Barkley in his uh, show where they were trying to teach him how to play golf. And he said, that's terrible. Yeah, it is terrible. <laughs> the Round Mound of Rebound, one of my favorites. This is one I didn't know, uh, was the microwave, Vinnie Johnson. Huh, that's a cool name. Uh, Vinnie Johnson. And then, uh, and I believe he was on the bad boys team of the uh, Detroit Pistons. Cool name, the microwave. All right, number two, the human highlight reel, better known as Dominique Wilkins. He was an amazing scorer and could put the hoop, put the ball in the hoop from anywhere in the court. The human highlight reel, Dominique Wilkins. And the best, the best nickname of all time. I've mentioned he was in my top five, the one and only Magic Johnson. Uh, of course, like I said, him and Larry Legend brought this game pretty much to where it was today. They, they were the predecessors to Michael Jordan and they, they brought it, they, they re, re energized the game, which has led to a global game now. It, it's so much farther than anything could have ever be imagined in the late 1800s when this game was, was created. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, any remarks, please let me know. Send them to C to Shining C 2019 at gmail.com or reach out to me on Chris Casey 71 on Twitter. I'd be happy to listen or, or uh, respond to you. My next episode, I have a real special treat for you. I have a young man who's going to be playing for the Western Carolina Catamount at slot receiver from this area, Cox Mill High School in the Concord, North Carolina area. If you're familiar with that, that's where the Charlotte Motor Speedway is. But I'm friends with his dad who played ball himself, and we're going to talk. We're going to have him in for my first ever interview. We're going to talk to an American football player. That'll be your next episode of Sea to Shining Sea. Thank you so much for listening. As I tell you every episode, have a great day, but a better tomorrow. I'm Chris Casey, and this is Sea to Shining Sea.